at last. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the uh, agrarian crisis. Um, now, mainstream, um, mainstream economists and policymakers give prime importance, as we know, to market solutions to problems. And they pay rather little attention to institutions and to organizations. Yet countries, we know, are replete with examples of market failures, especially when you're dealing with inequalities and reaching the most disadvantaged populations. So, um, excuse me, I'm just looking for, yes. Uh, so uh, what I will present today, in a sense, is outside the mainstream, both in terms of the questions I ask and the answers that I try and give. And it's very much, of course, in keeping with the GDI's interdisciplinary approach and the heterodox economics that post-crash economic society has been promoting. So what is the context? Now, the, the context is the agrarian crisis, which is facing small and marginal farmers across large parts of South Asia, what we see is high levels of landlessness, growing inequality, dwindling plot sizes, and fragmented holdings. And this is set against the, the challenge and backdrop of climate change, of rather limited non-farm options, and a feminization of agriculture. So in fact, the kind of uh, agrarian transition that you had had in Europe um, more than a century or more ago has not exactly taken place. Now, the so if you, if you just see this, um, this set of um, uh, tables, uh, you get a sense of the um, increasing proportion of marginal holdings over a period of time, and the uh, marginal holdings, increasing proportion of land in marginal holdings, and decreasing if you look at large farms. 10 hectares might seem quite a small farm in Britain or in Europe, but actually um, in this context, it is more than a medium-sized uh, farm. And, and so you, this, 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 uh, these figures give you an idea. Now, what is the government response to this pain? The government has responded by, um, to what I call farmers' distress by focusing on market manipulations. We talk about market solutions, but I think these are market manipulations uh, rather than institutional solutions. So in India, for instance, and as you know, India is federated. It has large number of states. Now, most state governments have favored minimum support prices for farmers and farm loan waivers. A lot of farmers have debt, and they do it as a populist measure. However, many small farmers are mostly net buyers of food grains, and they have limited access to formal credit. So if you're a really small farmer, you may sell <clears throat> uh, some of your food grains in order to buy other things, and then you buy back. So in, in overall terms, you're a net buyer of food grains, and many of them actually don't have access to formal credit. So uh, measures like um, loan waivers or minimum support prices actually bring them rather little relief. What they do need is mechanisms for increasing productivity, particularly government invest in investment in irrigation. I mean, if you take a country like India, 40, only 44% of its irrigable area is irrigated after decades of uh, development. And what you also need is institutional innovation. But in India and globally, we have paid rather little attention to the institutional transformation of agriculture. So the what is the debate? The debate is on farm types, um, uh, is focused on two types of farms, pre-existing, which is small family farms and large commercial farms. So globally, and when I first encountered this figure, I was myself taken aback, most farms are small. 85% of farms across 111 countries some of these are even in Europe, cultivate less than two hectares. So some people see smallholders as having great potential for providing viable livelihoods. Others favor large commercial farms on the grounds that they are more economically efficient, let the economically efficient farms do all the production, and others should move out uh, to other occupations. But both types of uh, farmers have constraints. Small farmers have serious resource constraints in developing countries, and large commercial farms are unlikely to provide the jobs and the means to reduce rural poverty. So, so just for instance, in, in India, uh, something like only 15% of the GDP comes from agriculture, but 65% um, of the population is still, uh, of the workforce is still in agriculture. 
So what I'm arguing here is that we really need to think of alternative um, models of farming. Now this becomes even more imperative for women because in India over 70% of rural women workers are still dependent on agriculture. And over 35% of all agricultural workers in India are women. Now their proportions are likely to grow as more men than women um, move to non-farm jobs. And this is, this is a global trend, except in Europe, if you, if you map it, uh, then you'll find that uh, more men than women tend to leave. And um, the welfare, therefore, of rural families and of a country's agricultural growth will depend in notable extent on the performance of women farmers. However, women's ability to deliver on production is even more cur curtailed than of small farmers in general, due to gender bias in access to land, technology, capital, irrigation, credit, and other essentials. They also have limited bargaining power with the state and with markets. So the question is, could a solution lie in group farming? What is group farming? The idea is that small farmers voluntarily pool their land, labor, capital, and skills to create a medium-sized enterprise, which they cultivate jointly, sharing the costs and benefits. But, and this is very important, without forfeiting their individual um, rights in, of ownership in the land that they pool. So can group farming help small farmers in general and women farmers in particular overcome their resource constraints and enhance their productivity and profits? And then one can also ask um, beyond the economics, can it also empower them socially and politically? So one can argue this case uh, conceptually but you rarely get a chance to test this out. And in India, two state-level experiments in group farming, begun in the 2000s, gave me a unique chance to answer these questions. Now, what were these, um, these two initiatives? Um, they're both in South India. I'll, in a minute, I'll show you the map. Now, these were in Kerala and Telangana, um, uh, two states of India. Uh, encouraged, what they did was they encouraged rural women and only women to lease in land collectively, to pool their labor capital, and cultivate it jointly. Now, these in initiatives were innovative, not only in promoting group farming, but in recognizing women as farmers outside the domain of family farms, in which women are typically unpaid workers with limited autonomy. Now, this might be somewhat different in, in the number of African countries, but it is certainly across Asia you cultivate as a family. Now, to date, barring my, more re my own recent work, there's been little uh, systematic empirical analysis of group farming in India or in developing countries more generally. And some of these results are in a couple of papers. One is a world development paper. There are a few copies here uh, for later, and another is forthcoming in Journal of Peasant Studies. So what did I, what, what did I do? Um, so I'll come back to this. What I did was I undertook primary surveys in both states during 2012 to 14 for a sample of group farms and individual farms. And what I wanted to examine especially was, can the group farms outperform the individual family farms in productivity and profit? Now, of course, the idea of cooperation farming is not new, and it can take a range of forms. So, so for instance, um, you can have cooperation, what I call single purpose cooperation, which is cooperation in marketing, which is quite common. I mean, it goes back a few hundred years, even in Europe, especially for dairy. Or you can cooperate on input purchase, um, but you do individual, um, individual cultivation. Then you have what I call single purpose medium cooperation, where you might invest jointly in, a, in private irrigation or in large machines because no individual farmer would be, um, it would be able to use that economically or to be able to afford it. And you have examples of that even in India going back at least more than a century. But the cultivation is still individual. Then you, ha you can have, um, so especially today when we talk about ecological problems, we say, well, we need to plan as communities and across boundaries, and therefore we should do crop planning and ecological planning together. And um, so you have some examples of that, but again, the cultivation is individual. And then the last form can be fully integrated um, cooperation, which is what I call pool group farming, which is you pool land, labor, capital, skills, um, and you, um, it ha and you uh, are able, therefore, to, be, uh, to 
um, both reap profits and if there are losses, also to be able to uh, share them. Now, um, this, none of this, uh, the first four, first uh, three, involve cooperation in production. And the last one, of course, produces particular challenges because it means that the whole labor process is on an everyday basis. If you're farming together, um, sowing, harvesting, well, sowing, uh, preparing the land, irrigation, weeding, and so on, um, then it's a whole range of operations. The history of, of course, the idea of group farming is not new. So you have a whole range of examples, and I call them for waves of farm collectives. The uh, most famous or infamous, if you like, which we all would know about, is in former socialist countries. And they were constituted on the basis of forced collectivization of peasant farms. And there's a huge literature on there. Um, and we know today that they had seriously negative effects, both on productivity and on output, and especially on the welfare of uh, rural communities. The second wave, and as you go down, you'll find that this less and less known. So the second wave was in the 60s, and the most important of this was that influenced by the idea of socialism, at that point the negative effects were not clear, um, countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as part of land reform, said, well, as part of land reform, let us also talk about cooperation. So you have, some of you may know of the Ujamaa experiment in, uh, in, uh, in Tanzania. We know of um, examples in Ethiopia, in, in India. And there was, of course, the particular one of kibbutz. Um, so, um, you know, I've just given you a, a few pictures. Sorry, I've given you a few pictures here. The pictures are not incidental. They were specifically chosen as examples. This is later. I'll come back to this. But this is the earliest, and this is the second, 1960s. There's another, what I call the kind of a third wave, which is even less known, interestingly. Also in the 1960s, was that in France, there were successfully, largely male-managed group farms. And where did they come from? They were driven by young Catholic farmers' movement who wanted to create a model which was, they did not have the excesses either of capitalism or socialism, and they wanted to be near the communities. And in fact, they were helped by, supported by priests. And in 1962, France passed a law which to enable the formation of group farms. Even today, and this is another, I'm, I'm done a survey and I'm studying France, is that um, today, something like 15% of all farm enterprises are, are forms of group farms. So it's not like 1% or 0.5%, it's quite substantial. And then I recently discovered that, yes, there's also Norway. Um, so, so I'm willing to call it uh, a kind of wave, if you like. Fourth is the 1990s, and this is post-socialism. So um, after, um, uh, you know, 89, um, in the post-socialist phase, a lot of collectives were decollectivized, and people in the collective were then given little slivers of land, the, the, you know, which, were, which was earlier part of the collective. These were too small to be viable, they didn't have machines, they didn't have other inputs. So you find that what they began to do was to come together with families and neighbors, pool this land. And this has been interestingly studied. Uh, you find examples in Romania, Kyrgyzstan, East Germany, Nicaragua. Uh, <clears throat> there must be others, but those four have been well studied. And what is interesting is that they came together because of scarcity of land and machinery, they did extremely well in production. But they were male managed and women remained unpaid family workers. But the group farms in India that I'm going to be focusing on are quite different. If you want, you'll call it a fifth wave. A colleague of mine said, can you call it a wave? I said, well, wait and see. We'll discover more examples. But <clears throat> they are quite different because they are voluntarily constituted, egalitarian, and managed entirely by women. Also remember, these are a collective of individuals and not of families. That's quite important. Now, conceptually, one can, uh, we would ex why would we expect this to matter? Now, conceptually, I'm arguing that uh, pooling resources and joint cultivation can bring benefits to small farmers. So group farming could help enlarge farm size um, you know, through pooling owned and leased in land. It could increase, increase the economic viability through economies of scale. Uh, and in fact, um, 
There is a study by um, Andrew Foster and Mark Rosenweig um, who asked, are Indian farms too small? And they did, took all India data and they tried to assess um, when you start when very small and the farm size rises, what happens? And what they find is up to eight hectares from very small, you have increases in profit per hectare. Also, uh, groups can help you save on hired labor. Um, they can bring a larger pool of funds and inputs. They can tap into a greater diversity of skills than can be possessed by one person or one family. You can experiment with more risk-prone, higher-value crops with larger payoffs. You could also spread losses among a larger number. And one could argue they could better deliver on contacts. And most importantly, they might have greater bargaining power with markets and the state. For women farmers, these gains are likely to be larger than for men. Why? Because they have greater economic constraints. And also a group can help women overcome social restrictions. Now, if you look at social norms in South Asia, there's quite serious social constraints to their mobility, to dealing with markets and marketplaces. Um, uh, and um, I mean, you can't just go into a tea shop in, in a village in India as, as a woman and say, OK, well, please, I want six laborers, and who's going to come? Uh, you know, so, so, so there are, and similarly, for market yards and marketplaces. So if as a group they are able to, uh, they would be able to overcome some of these constraints. Quite apart from the fact that women who are working as farm wives are not recognized as farmers. So it has the potential of creating an identity for them as farmers. Now this is seldom possible in male managed family farms. So the groups, um, of course, we, we can constitute groups. If you have a group of people who all own land, you can constitute a group by pooling in land, but also um, you can constitute a group by leasing in land or a mix of the two. Now, there is a difference between this because um, obviously if you're leasing in land, it's more ten tenure insecure. And, but since most uh, women don't own land in South Asia or indeed in most parts, large parts of Africa as well, uh, they are much more dependent in this case, in these examples, on leasing in land with all the constraints. And then, of course, economic empowerment is not the be-all and end-all. They could lead to more social and political empowerment. But let us first consider the economic effects. Now, prior to mine, there were two only two types of studies <clears throat> that actually looked at the productivity uh, of uh, different farm types of farm enterprises. One set of studies, um, you know, both of them are linked with, with uh, socialism. So the po they're post-socialist studies. The first set are from the 90s, uh, 1980s and early 90s. And what they do is they compare smallholders with large state-promoted collective farms. And typically, they have regional-level data. And some of them find that outputs of collective farms are higher. Some find, find they're lower. So you actually get a very mixed effect. Uh, the second set of studies um, here is the 2000s. And that, uh, those are the studies which have good data sets. They have um, uh, you know, the farm level data. And there uh, they find that the group farms have higher productivity than individual farms. My India examples, uh, as I said, in Kerala and Telangana are distinct because of being constituted only of women, and they're outside the socialist experience. So what are these? Um, so there, here's a map of India. Many of you know it. Others may not. But <clears throat> my field sites are, this, this is Andhra Pradesh. It's very difficult to find immediately a map which uh, gives the bifurcation. But this was split into two um, a few years ago. And that's Telangana around here. And this is Kerala. Now, some of you might know Kerala because there's a lot of work by Amartya Sen who's talked about the positive indicators of Kerala, which, uh, unlike the rest of India, very high levels of uh, <clears throat> no missing women, uh, high levels of female education, and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, the, um, the basic model is similar in both cases. In both cases, the, in the two examples, the women are leasing in land. They're pooling labor and capital, and they share the costs and benefits. They, can, they also work simultaneously, if they want, on their family farms, if they have any. Um, and, uh, so, and they have a task rotation mechanism so that it releases, you know, not every woman has to be together with other women all the time on the group fields. So there is a degree of flexibility. 
Now in Kerala, so where did these ideas come from? And this whole um, other analysis I've done, but the, in Kerala, the initial idea of group farming came from village women who, in, in some areas where there was fallow land, they experimented in leasing in um, with, uh, uh, with that. But the larger program was crafted by uh, government officials and intellectuals. And it was structured around the self-help group model. Now, how many of you have heard of self-help groups? Any? Yes. Okay. My colleagues have, and yes, and you have. Um, these are, you've all heard of uh, microcredit, right? You've heard of the Grameen Bank. Well, the self-help group does saving and credit. It's not exactly the same model, but somewhat similar. You have small groups, you have homogeneous groups, and increasingly, they are women. Now, India has several million self-help groups today. But the, what they, Kerala did was it modified the self-help group model um, to, to actually take neighborhood groups. So neighborhood groups are saving and credit groups. Uh, and the whole program is located within a multi-level um, multi structure of governance. I call them the three pillars. So there's a first pillar, which is the government's um, uh, state poverty eradication program. Uh, and the, uh, which is the Kudum Shri mission. The second pillar, and I'll come back to this later, is a network, a community network, which is constituted of community development societies at the village council level. These are autonomous registered bodies with elected office bearers, with the neighborhood groups at the bottom tier, and then you go up to the village, uh, to the top, which is at the village council level. And the third pillar is the village council, which in India is, uh, these, are, these are councils are elected periodically. Um, and uh, in Kerala, village council can be very large. It can cover many villages. Now, the group farms are constituted of women who are prior members of neighborhood groups. Not all women in the neighborhood groups constitute group farms. They may do another, they may set up a shop, or they may do other group activity. Um, so, uh, but those who have backgrounds in farming tend to um, do uh, group farming. And there's a degree of self-selection, but it's very interesting that if you actually look at the people who didn't do group farming, there's very similar characteristics in terms of schooling, in terms of economic status, credit access. So there's little systematic difference between those who uh, choose to do group farming and those who don't. Um, now, these groups get subsidized credit uh, through a, a national development bank in India, which doesn't require collateral. What it requires is you form a group, and after six months of functioning, you can apply for credit. They also receive support from, the, um, from this first pillar, the state, the Kudumshri mission, uh, a startup grant, technical information, training from experts, and some incentives. And also at the village council level, 10% of the budget is for women's programs, but not only for group farming. So what these, this support does is it produces a somewhat level playing field for women. It doesn't mean they have a huge advantage, but it does level the playing field a bit. And there are, uh, this is a picture, um, uh, and you, these are, there are today more than 62,000 group farms in Kerala. I, the pictures are not incidental, they are specifically chosen. If you normally see pictures of um, women in fields, um, whether it's India or China or Thailand, they are usually bent double, right? They're transplanting rice. And you rarely see them stand up and uh, have a partilla in their, at their commanding a partilla. In Telangana, and I'll come back, this is the second field site. Um, there were they were 500 women's groups, and this was implemented differently because here uh, the U UN UNDP and the and the uh, central government um, tried this experiment as a, on a five-year basis. They provided five years of support, also in 2000 and around 2001, and it was implemented through a local quasi NGO. Now, this NGO was set up in 1993 through another government program which tried to empower women, uh, uh, that is, through education. But uh, <clears throat> they also did social empowerment. And what they had done was they'd formed women's collectives in the 90s prior to the group farming experiment, one per village um, in a, a large number of villages. When the group farming project came along, they grafted or they, they used the same groups and offered them this new project. So um, the old sanghas then began to do group farming. 
Each group again received a small backup grant, implements, training, um, but much less than in Kerala. And government support ended, and this is key, after five years when UNDP funded. Uh, funding ended. Nevertheless, when I visited these groups in 2011, I was surprised to find that 50% of them were still functioning, and therefore, hence my study. So what I wanted to do, just to tell, give you an idea of the, so this is, I've already told you about this, um, uh, uh, the, the Telangana structure, and what I did was collect data. Now, I wanted to, as I said, compare group farms in each state with individual farms who were two hectares or less, small individual farms, and see whether they differed in productivity and profits. And I collect, this data was collected in 2012-13 and took an entire year to gap fill. Those of you who do empirical work will, will understand that gap filling and cleaning out takes a long time. And it was collected with two districts in Kerala and three districts in Telangana. Now, Kerala, the two districts, um, any of you know Kerala? Been to Kerala? No? Uh, you've been to Kerala. So the two districts are Alapuza and Thishur. Alapuza is actually uh, dominated by uh, food crop production, paddy, and Thishur um, is predominant dominated uh, in, in this here by the cultivation of commercially commercial cultivation of banana. And both of them grow vegetables. My Kerala sample consists of 250 uh, farms. 69 all women's groups, 181 individual family farms. And these uh, family farms uh, of the women are family farms of the women members, but selected randomly from among them. In Telangana, you have three districts um, that, I, that were selected. Uh, and uh, here, um, there are 70 group farms and 693 individual farms, again, two hectares and less, randomly selected in the villages where they're located. And the individual farms in Telangana are of two types. One is the, the women collectives, their family farms, and then there's group farms, who are individual farms who are not related to the groups. What is important to remember is that 95% in both states of the individual farms are male managed. I collected uh, weekly data for every input and output for each crop and plot used by the farms. In addition, we did focus group for an entire year. Uh, and then in addition, the information on farm, farmer characteristics through focus group discussions. So um, just to give you uh, an idea about uh, some basic characteristics of these um, Telangana and group farms. And what this table will help you do is make two kinds of comparisons. One is a comparison of the characteristics of the group and individual farms in each state. And the second is group farm characteristics in Telangana and Kerala. Now, firstly, uh, their group, uh, they, they differ in size, they differ in social composition. Kerala's groups have, um, it's, it's, uh, that's in another table, but Kerala's groups have six members. All of them are literate, two-thirds have done secondary school and above and only 9% are 60 years and above. Most importantly, and I think this is the really important point, you'll see in a, uh, as I go along, that the Kerala groups are heterogeneous. So although they are Hindus, you find that only about 9% are scheduled caste, which is the lowest caste. And most of them are um, higher caste, middle caste, and upper caste. And they also differ um, you know, their variations in their religious variations. In the case of Telangana, you find that, again, they are mainly Hindus, but they are predominantly, um, they are predominantly um, scheduled caste. So they are, uh, in both cases, they're not very rich, but uh, they are uh, poor, but they're also the lowest caste. Now, this is, uh, this is important. This issue of heterogeneity is very important because there's a common assumption in um, standard collective action theory that you know, homogeneity will help you in, in terms of cooperation. And this was proactively uh, decided that, no, they will go for heterogeneity. Why was it decided? Because, firstly, they said, well, our neighborhoods have heterogeneity, so they're, they're more representative and we, we want to root the programs in neighborhoods. The second was, according to them, it would ensure leadership. 
the logic being that local women's leadership doesn't come from the poorest of the poor, but it comes from those who are just above, at least just above the poverty line. And the third, and this is something I discovered, they have a much wider social base. This is really key. Um, whereas if you are homogeneous, but you are dis homogeneously disadvantaged, it reduces the scope of your social capital. So I'm sure you'll ask me, well, what about potential conflicts um, cast and so on? And they, in Kerala, they deal with it by rotating the meetings among different women of different castes. Um, and uh, over time, they get over the, their normal prejudices. Telangana's groups are not only homogeneous, more homogeneous, but they're also very large. Uh, average is 22 members, but some of them have more than that, 30, 40, even 54 members. 38% are liter illiterate, and 17% have 60 years plus. Now, in both states, almost all the women come from land, small landowning families. So then we're not really talking about people who have absolutely landless. They all have small bits of land, but the amounts of land are quite small. The second thing to keep in mind is that group farms, interestingly, as we would expect, are larger than individual farms. So here we see that in Kerala, the individual farms are 0.35 hectares, very small. Here it's almost one hectare. In the case of Telangana, they are the individual farms around one hectare, they are here they are two hectares. So one could say, one would expect that they would, that at least they would be able to reap some economies of scale as a result of that. The second is that individual farmers are, um, all of them have owned land and some add to that by leased land. None of them are pure leasers. In the case of the women, they're all 100% more or less as leased in farmers. Um, now, and most of them lease them from outside the group. It is cash rent basis for those who are interested in land tenure issues. Um, and, the, and the fact that they have to lease in land, I'll come back to. So when you begin compar comparing them and you begin to look at um, uh, the women's group farms and the individually managed, mostly male managed farms, there are at least four disadvantages that they start out with. The first disadvantage is that they depend on leased in land, which means that if you have no own land, it means huge amounts of transaction costs you have to find out. There's no broker there, you actually have to find out who's willing to lease you the land. You have to find a suitable uh, plot and sometimes if you want to lease one hectare, you may find that you can't find it in a consolidated plot. You get a little plot here, you get a little plot there. And you would like, them, like it to be reasonably close to where you are so that you don't have to walk long distances. So this is, a, this is at first disadvantage, but also um, the leases are oral, do you, do you, which means that they don't write them down. And they're informal. So you have actually no proof that you are leasing in. Now, all of the government schemes assume that you're a farmer, you'll be able to prove it, and so you want to have subs first life subsidy or any other subsidy, um, you, you need to be able to do that. With oral leases, you have no document to show that you're actually a farmer, and that's, that's a second disadvantage. The third is, of course, there are structural disadvantages. There's an enormous literature on this, World Bank, FAO, and other literature, which shows there are systematic biases in women's access, women farmers' access, to inputs, credit, uh, and, and uh, uh, extension services. I remember in the 80s, there was a huge discussion when they would say, well, a male extension worker, even if he was a carpenter, he would go and talk to the husband who's a carpenter and not talk to the woman who's actually doing the farming. So they began to talk about women extension workers. But these, these are the sorts of biases um, that you see. And uh, the, the uh, women, of course, uh, face other social um, uh, norm disadvantages. And then there are, they have rather little experience in farm management. I'm not saying they don't have experience in farming. They'll know how to prepare the field or sow and, uh, and harvest and, and weed and so on, but farm management requires that you're actually in charge of the enterprise, which means you negotiate in markets, you buy inputs, you get labor and so on and so forth. Um, and many of them were housewives of the workers in family farms. Um, 
Now, some of these disadvantages uh, can be overcome with state support, but not all of them. Um, now, maybe I should, you know, so one of the things that economic theory says is, well, people are driven by self-interest, and they will not cooperate. So there's a free rider problem. Have you heard of the free rider problem that you, um, X number of people look after? Suppose you, you, know, you, you come in, it's a, suppose all of you are told, well, let's clean this building. Five of you turn up, you clean up the building. Everybody else is free riding because they get a clean building. And the same could be true for public parks and so on. So you have to deal with the possibility that some people will put in more labor and others not. So they have a mechanism for doing that. It's less here because you, they are your neighbors. They can't get away from, uh, from uh, because they know you and everybody knows each other. There's not much of a free riding problem. But nevertheless, sometimes people don't turn up for work. And so they have a mechanism of either finding a substitute or finding the person equivalent to a daily wage. So they have a mechanism dealing with that. OK, so now let's get to the background and what then you are, I'm sure, very anxious to know what happens to productivity and profits. So I'll just give you, this is my model. It's a very simple model. Uh, and if you're not economists, well, most of you are. Um, so basically what I've done is I've measured in this productivity. And the dummies are, I can't actually see this. So you have the, um, uh, the dummies in terms of the uh, farm types. And this is the dependent variable, uh, annual value of output, and various other. And then you have inputs, um, fertilizer, et cetera. You have irrigation as an input. Then you have cropping patterns. And then you have demographic variables. And then fixed effects are controlled through the, the district dummies and so on. So how do these group farms perform? Well, they do strikingly well in Kerala in most part, and they don't do that well in Telangana. So here's just initially a cross tabulation. Just have a second to look at these figures. And um, you'll see that uh, if you take the annual value of output per hectare, group farms output is 1.8 times more than that of the individual family farm. Also, um, if you take a major crop like banana, the commercial crop, Group farms have 1.6 times the average yields of individual farms. What they don't do that well in is paddy cultivation. And we can come back to the reason for that, but an important reason for that is that uh, rice cultivation requires a particular, particularly good land, and you are very, it's very difficult to get good land for paddy cultivation if you're leasing in land because farmers who have it want to cultivate it themselves. Now, these are, these are my regressions. Um, the paper has them all. So these results are supported by the regressions. And basically, one interprets this in terms of a shift from individual farms. This is the individual farms to group farms is, uh, uh, is associated with an increase in annual output of 30%. In the case of banana, a shift from individual to group farms is linked with an increase in output of 348%. And this banana story is very important. By the way, India is one of the largest exporters of banana uh, globally. Now here, although all farmers try and fine tune their banana to demand, you know, the sales to demand, to get advantage of higher prices, especially during the festival season, the women's groups are able to work the market especially well. And some have negotiated contracts with temples, local temples, for special banana varieties. Now, because they're a group, they can ensure delivery in a way that individual, very small farmers can't. Now, in both, uh, in both these cases, annual output uh, and uh, banana yields, the most important, of course, input driving it is labor um, and, uh, in, and, and so on. So, I mean, I won't spend too much time interpreting this because there's a lot of other stuff. Um, in paddy, they, as I said, they don't do so well, and they don't do so well um, here, you can see that they don't do so well because they're not able to access good paddy land. The Telangana story is different. Here, the group farms perform worse than in individual farms in their annual value of output. So I've just uh, highlighted the group farms, but you can just compare it with this, for instance, just the next line, and you'll see that they have not performed in the case of annual value of output and in the case of food grains they don't perform as well. 
they don't do that, that badly or very differently in cotton. Now, this is very interesting, that they don't do so well uh, as group farms. They do really badly on group farms in case of food grains, but they are fairly equivalent, especially if you look at my regressions, in terms of cotton. Why do they then grow food grains? It's semi-arid. They don't have much irrigation. It's because the um, NGO, like many other uh, NGOs, feel that growing your own food leads to food security. So there's general presumption that growing your food leads to food security. But in fact, of course, not under all conditions. And these results indicate that. Now, if you look at the groups, the, the, um, the, these are the regressions for um, annual productivity, and the, 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 uh, they highlight what I've already said. But if you look at the crop-specific ones, and you look at this, in the case of cotton, they actually don't do any worse than individual family farms. So many of them then say that if we were growing cotton, we would actually be able to perform very much better. Um, so basically, we get three points on the productivity results. Firstly, Kerala's group farms do substantially better than individual family farms, while Telangana's groups do worse than individual farms. In both states, women's, women's groups do much better in commercial crops than traditional food grains, where land quality and experience matter more. And the positive land productivity, you find there's a positive land productivity, land labor productivity relationship, underlines that group, groups enjoy an advantage over individual farms by pooling their land and labor, because it helps increase farm size and it helps them overcome peak labor. Uh, shortages. And then one other set of results I want to share with you. These are net returns. Net returns I've calculated when you take uh, the uh, total value of output and you deduct all paid out costs. I'm not imputing values for family labor or family land. And um, what do you see? In Kerala, um, Group farms, the average returns are strikingly higher than individual farms, and these differences are statistically significant. I control for district-level effects and so on. In fact, the mean net return here, these are in Indian rupees, is five times higher than the mean net return of individual small family farms. And they are three times higher than the state average for that year. Also, 38% of these farms Earn uh, on annually 50,000 rupees on net returns per farm, whereas the, an, the average for the state was 45. In fact, even in Telangana, what is interesting is that the group farms make up for the low productivity in annual net returns because they spend so much less on hired labor. So you have large uh, groups and hired labor, you know, the labor costs have been rising and hired labor costs are very. Um, hired labor is very expensive. So then we ask the obvious question. Is it an obvious question? Is it a question you want to hear about? Why do Kerala farms, group farms, do so much better than individual family farms and Telangana does not? So in my view, there are uh, five types of factors. One is, of course, you remember I talked about state support. There was a continuous state commitment, state support of the program. In the case of Telangana, it stopped after five years, and even when it was ongoing, it was not um, hugely enthusiastic from the state government. The second is, and I, we, I can talk about this much more in the Q&A, is the institutional structure. Now, normally, you know, we don't think of, um, we think of farms, there's mm, small family farms, uh, there are commercial farms, but we don't think of the additional institutional structures which could or could not support them. And what they created in Kerala was this pillar of community development societies which were elected and registered as individual bodies, if you remember. And that provides them huge strength in bargaining with both the state and the village council. Whereas in Telangana, what you had is federations which don't have the same negotiating power. Then there is, interestingly, for those of you who do the rural economy, there is a subsidized credit, which Kerala takes into advantage of and uh, Andhra doesn't, and uh, Telangana doesn't. The second set is group 
uh, the third is group composition. Kerala's groups are small, six on average, they are, and they're heterogeneous, whereas Telangana groups are large, 22 on average, and some are very much larger, and they are more homogeneous. Then there are production conditions. So if you grow commercial farming, they're doing much better than if you're doing family uh, food crops, and also access to inputs and land and they have higher rainfall. Now this question of land is extremely important because you remember I said that if you have a heterogeneous group across caste, they're able to access land through various caste groups because of their social networks and social capital. Whereas if you're poor and homogeneous, they are dependent on their own community predominantly to lease in land and that dependence means that if your original community is disadvantaged, then you're quite disadvantaged in your ability to lease in land. And that, so the, the issue of heterogeneity really matters. And then, of course, the way it was conceptualized, and I, I won't spend too much time on that. Okay, but what do they both get right? What they both get right is that beyond issues of productivity and profits, what has it given them for the future? and I call it capability enhancement. So the first thing is that the women have strong identities as farmers in their own right. And they say it quite clearly. You know, they say that um, they're not seen as laborers or farm wives. So they say, for instance, group farming has enriched my farming experience. Through the group, I realized I had good leadership qualities and could also manage the technical aspects of farming. Other group members now listen to me carefully. Secondly, it's familiarized themselves with a range of public institutions and services. So for instance, uh, even in Kerala, they're saying, before joining the group, we had no contacts with bank officials, agricultural officials, and government officials. After registering as a group, we could start a bank account, attend training classes, and develop a good rapport with these officials. Third, they've learned to negotiate in multiple markets. So they negotiate in land markets, they judge the land quality, they negotiate lease terms, and, and, and so on in input markets. Also very interestingly, you know, in Telangana, uh, they are able to negotiate a space in market yards. You know, when you, this is not something that you obviously think about. But when you think about it, that you, know, you take a lot of produce, you can't take it every day, your customers may come over a period of time, you need storage space. And that's what they've been able to negotiate. I mean, it's, uh, it's striking that they said earlier women had not even seen market yards, and now they're very visible negotiating and so on. And most importantly, of course, they've learned to make production decisions and manage the farms independently. Then if you recall, I'd said, well, there's the economic empowerment aspect, or what about social and political? So this is, this is based on focus group, on what they say their self-perception is about social empowerment. In Telangana, and remember these are women, low caste women who are seriously socially disadvantaged, historically, and continue to be. So for them, the question of respect is extremely important. Even simple things like, how, how do you call us by our nicknames? Uh, you, you make us sit on the floor. So when they say now as group members, we, we, are, we can actually tell villagers um, uh, about social awareness programs, they call us by our own names and they call us respectfully, uh, it matters a great deal. And, and again, in Kerala, uh, this, I, this idea about knowing a person by their own names is, goes back a long way. If you look at Fanshen on China, when they first um, did, uh, this was pre, uh, pre Mao, pre all of that, when land was distributed and men and women both got land, the women, the first thing they said was, I'm now going to be known as my, by myself and not as somebody's mother or somebody's wife. And, and the same in, same in India. Um, and, and so, um, and in, uh, the, the other thing which I'm not now going to show a slide about is political empowerment. So what you're finding it in both states, women are now appearing for elections in the village councils and large numbers are winning. In fact, in Kerala, all the political parties now seek Kudumshri members to stand um, for elections. Um, 
And this is before, you know, there, there's one third reservation, but this is beyond that. Okay, so let me um, do some, some reflections on issues of replication. So we began by asking, can group farming be an alternative to resource-constrained small family farms? Can they empower women? So my answer to the first was a qualified yes, and to the second, an unqualified yes. Because we know that economically, the Kerala groups performed strikingly better than individual farms, and especially in commercial farming. In Telangana, they did okay in commercial farming, but not so well in, uh, in uh, food crops. And in both states, they, uh, they had good net returns, and they were, women were socially and politically empowered. So what should we do and what should we not do? I, it seems to me Kerala provides examples of what you should do and Telangana of some of the things that you perhaps should not be doing. Um, no. So, um, so for instance, um, we, uh, the idea that um, if you're very disadvantaged, you're forming a group, that's not enough. You actually need to um, have government support, administrative support, institutional, technical, financial. Then group autonomy and governance structures matter. The question of heterogeneity and farm size matters. And the most important is really access to land. And for that, I think we don't have 100% answers at the moment. This slide, however, the next slide I want to share with you, and a couple only slides left, is something which is very interesting because you will say, fine, this has been happening in Andhra and Kerala on a very substantial scale. When we talk about replication, where else is it happening? And this is an ongoing action research project of which I'm also a part. This is a group uh, um, which uh, started working just um, three years ago. And this is in Eastern India, in West Bengal, in Bihar, and then in uh, Nepal. And in these three years, they form these groups. And what is very interesting about, you'll find in this slide, is that different kinds of models are emerging. So in the case of Kerala and Andhra, they were all, all the, it was all women's groups. They um, had pooled all their resources on the basis of leased farming. Here you find that they're mixed groups. They're men and women. They're all women's groups. They're all men's groups. Um, and the models are different. So here you have landless, full cooperation, and they are leasing in land, uh, pooling. This, that's like the Andhra and Kerala, except that they're not only all women. The second model is they're pooling private plots. This is happening in West Bengal, for instance, where the men are pooling their small amounts of land. We've, we got some, I had some examples in Kerala where, where we find men's groups, about eight or nine, not very many. And here you find that the men have, sta pooling, have started pooling their land. Uh, and they, they pool everything, land labor inputs, and so on. And also in Nepal. These two are interesting models um, in that they pool their resources for certain things and not for others. So for instance, if you have a contiguous plot, you have little strips, you, uh, you, you bring in a machine, and then you, you, um, uh, you prepare the land together or you do irrigation together, but then you individually do all the other operations. And this is a fourth model. Now this is very exciting because what you're seeing is they are evolving from ground up. They start with a certain model and then they adapt it to what works for them. So in fact, maybe it can become a wave. So let me end finally with this last uh, slide. Um, which is uh, more general that institutional innovations could prove key to economic gains. And this is to our post-crash um, students that let's look beyond market solutions, which I'm sure all of you agree with. The second is that co collectives can actually reduce state failure and market failure for the disadvantaged, particularly for the disadvantaged. However, groups alone cannot overcome major gender disadvantages such as land ownership. And we need other kinds of global reforms and tenancy reforms for that. And finally, and this is a project in process, that collective action theory needs revisiting. Now there's been quite a lot of adv advance in collective action theory, um, especially with uh, Ellen Ostrom's work and other people's work in relation to the commons. There's been rather little on um, collective action around private property resources. And so, you join together and you'll be happier farmers.
Thank you. Thank you.